have a chance to look over the the heat kernel stuff. Yeah, because that's that's important still also for today. Thanks. Okay, so we we were discussing anomalies, and today the, it's a gravitational anomalies. But I just have a little bit to finish off there. The basically anomalies happen when the the Lagrangian is invariant, but the path integral is not. And the, and the signal for this, this is the most understandable way to do it, is if you have fields, I'm doing fermion fields right here, but we'll do others. Under the symmetry, this goes to um, d psi. Psi, let's see, I think first these guys prime, and these are psi bar with some Jacobian. And that Jacobian tends to be e to the i the integral d four x the whatever the parameter is of the gauge transformation. So this is the parameter of the symmetry. And there's a coefficient here, which is let's just call it a two of x for now. And this is one over 16 pi squared times the usual A2 of X that you get in the heat kernel. And so the general situation is that for an anomaly like this, the uh, whatever your current would have been is this a2 of x, so 1 over 16 pi squared times the a2 coefficient. OK, good. The, um, and so this is the easiest way of doing it. We, we also did Feynman diagrams. Feynman diagram approach actually is different depending on the symmetries, but for the trace anomaly, the piece that we did, the scale symmetry, we said there were diagrams like this that were divergent, that we got the anomaly from one over D minus four times D minus four equals something finite. And that gave the same sort of behavior. So the basic point is that both of these are UV physics. It's either was regularizing the Jacobian or this divergences. And so for many years, I actually had those, the following worry. My worry was always, we can, we, maybe our fundamental theory is finite when we get up to the end and there is no real divergences like that. Then this theory part would have seemed to have fallen apart. And likewise, if, if we have new particles at high energy that are come in, maybe the Jacobian would be different. So the emphasis on the UV was a little bothersome, but there are also infrared der derivations also. So from low energy stuff. And so this ties in nicely with effective field theories. You can see the same physics at low energies. And so that's what I wanted to explain at the moment. There are two ways of doing that that I know of. One is these non-local Lagrangians. And the other is dispersion relations. <coughs> and the trace anomaly has been done both ways. The, the non-local piece is actually something we did before. So it's nice to tie into it. And again, the, you two here, I probably didn't see this, but when I did the background field method, if you did, when I did the background field method, I did loops and here's photons. And we know that there are divergences in the vacuum polarization that goes like one over epsilon. And there's also 
log Q squared pieces that come along with the divergences, okay? And we wrote that the divergences go into renormalizing the electric charge and the log Q squared, I've written a Lagrangian that's F mu nu log box F mu nu, where when that acts on the F mu nu, it turns into Q squared. And so that gives you the, the same effect as log Q squared. Okay. So the, the, um, in writing this Lagrangian here, I've, I've rescaled the field, sorry. I've rescaled the fields, the normal fields go now to one over E times the fields. Um, it's a convenient trick. Then the Lagrangian turns into one over four E squared, but this then lets me show you that it's actually the renormalized E. If I insist that this, is, this effect of Lagrangian is independent of the scale mu, the running of the coupling and the mu dependence there cancel each other out. So that's, that's good. Um, but now if I do my rescaling, like before, you know, A, um, A of X was written as one over lambda, A of lambda X, that, that type of thing. The, the first pieces here still are invariant. They're one F squared F and the D4X, which I change variables with this, are still invariant, but the log piece is no longer. So this is, this is what I call the non-local piece. If you, if you rescale log box, the relationship is like that. This action is no longer invariant. And so now the, the divergence of the dilatation current, which we argued is, is the energy momentum tensor is not zero anymore. And in fact, it just follows from, from this, uh, the coefficient here, it's, it's B, um, it's actually over two because it's log lambda squared there, B over two um, F mu nu, F mu nu. So that's under this rescaling shift. I get a non-invariant piece that's log lambda times this. And if I put the E squared back in, so I rescale, this is back normal. Um, it's B E squared over two, F mu nu, F mu nu. And this is the QED trace anomaly. And this is the coefficient of the beta function. Okay. So the, the, by having a local Lagrangian, we had the symmetry, having this non-local piece leads um, to a non-invariant, which gives the, reproduces the trace anomaly. So that's nice because this is, this log Q squared piece, the log box is something that lives at low energy. So it's a nice low energy effective field theory way of looking at this. Um, the, you sometimes see and in fact this is this is a non rigorous derivation that the the derivation go sort of the same way is you you write s is the integral d for x minus 1 over 4 e squared of of the scale, f mu nu, f mu nu. And then when you take delta s, delta lambda, this, this turns into um, integral d4x 
d by d lambda minus one over four e squared of lambda, um, which is, this turns then into one over two e cubed, that's an e, um, times the derivative respect to lambda of e of lambda. This is the beta function. And so this, this turns into then equals the beta function over 2e is, is, is what it really is in this case um, times f squared. Okay, so the the this is a non-rigorous derivation. I, I, I would it's in dynamics of the standard model, which is the chapter that I put on the website. You can see that done out. But what it really done properly is this non-local Lagrangian. Okay, so that's that's the um, non-local Lagrangian way of doing it. And here's the dispersion relation way. Okay, this is done by a guy who has the unpronounceable name of it's a check name with and when you put these little hatchets over R and check it's it's something that you can't say unless you were born in the Czech Republic it's something like like RZ at the same moment and the S is also tough so this is Gigi Ojeshi okay but he's done some very nice work, so I shouldn't make fun of the name. It's just so everyone in the Czech Republic knows it's unpronounceable. Um, anyway, so Mr. Hoshishi has, has shown how to do this. I'm not going to take you through the whole thing. And basically, he defines the various vertex functions, like this one, that involves the trace of the energy momentum tensor, decomposes it. And then you know that these vac vacuum polarization diagrams, the, this vacuum polarization diagram that goes like that can satisfy the dispersion relation where you reproduce it from its imaginary parts. The, um, this other one is, is one where there's a trace of the energy momentum tensor, it goes like this. You reproduce it from its its cuts in the S channel, and so writing in terms of the imaginary parts and, and the real parts, the imaginary parts then are on shell amplitudes. They guys calculate it. They they come up with this this formula here. Here's the here's the relationship that you you would normally see. Here's the anomaly sits there, and that integral then gives you the correct coefficient, which is good and all that. Um, and here's here's the integrand. But the, the main thing that I'm interested in for this integrand is not that it exists. We sort of know that it has to work, but that it's dominated by low energies. So if you look at it, it's done for a particle of mass m. It's the imaginary part starts at 4m squared. And so there's a integral with singularity. This is the imaginary part. It starts at 4m squared. This is a function of t. Integral singular, integrable singularity there. So it comes down and then it falls off. Okay, so it's certainly low energy dominated. And that's, that's the other piece of it. That's interesting. It's completely insensitive to the high energy physics of the of the calculation. So those are more, those are the two infrared effects. Now, in field theory, infrared and ultraviolet are, are get tied together, partially in dispersion relations by by the fact that you don't need subtractions, and in this case, it's the renormalization of the charge is a ultraviolet effect log box is an infrared effect. 
they get tied together at the same time. They're calculated from the same diagram. Anyway, so those that's that's my final business on non-gravitational stuff. Okay. So gravitational anomalies. The Okay, so now we can add gravity. The, I've talked so far about scale symmetry. In gravity, we talk about conformal symmetry, which I will explain to you what it is in a minute. These, these guys, are not exactly the same thing. They're variations, but they're not exactly the same. Okay. However, they are enough related that their anomalies are the same. Basically, they both are anomalies that are related to the trace of the energy momentum tensor. So to do scale symmetry with gravity, we just do what we did before. We have the fields, the A fields, the phi fields, everything rescaling. But in, in the metric, if we're just doing the scale symmetry, we actually just rescale it just the coordinates. Okay, so you just rescale the coordinates. And th there is no rescaling here, lambda to the zero uh, in the metric. And that just leaves all the other rescalings unchanged. You don't do anything else beyond that. Okay. Um, conformal symmetry, we'll see is actually a rescaling of the metric. So g mu nu um, goes to e to, let's call it two sigma of x, g mu nu. So that's the conformal transformation there. And so that, that's different. So we're here, we've rescaled the metric. But, you know, it, it can be related. If you, it can be related for if you take sigma as a constant, then we have ds squared is e to the two sigma um, dx g mu nu dx mu dx nu, and you can if it's just a constant, you can put it in rescale it into the rescaling of the field is g mu nu d e to the sigma x mu d e to the sigma x nu. And the, you can get the same effects out, okay? But it's different in principle. Okay. So I was just talking about conformal versus scale, which you know well, okay? We can do the scale symmetry already. Okay, because all you really need to do is just get the A2 coefficient, because that's what we, the calculation we did. And so T mu nu is then one over 16 pi squared, a trace of the A2 coefficient. And so for example, if you have a scalar field equals this is one over 16 pi squared, one over 180. It's r mu nu alpha beta, r mu nu alpha beta minus r mu nu, r mu nu minus box r 
and this is scalar. And I've used C is equal to one six because I'm gonna be doing that anyhow. Okay. Um, now that Bottom's here, I can do his own his own work. <laughs> the when we did scale symmetry, what I did Bottom was I just showed them this this what I find very cool derivation of of the scale transformation by varying log box. And I had previously in the course done the vacuum polarization in 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 my effective field theory section. So we did effective field theory and I mentioned that we do the vacuum polarization. You get the one over epsilons, which go into the renormalization, and you get the log q squareds, and the log q squareds then get reproduced here. And so you can also get the same. The coefficients here are determined from from the A2 coefficients. And so here is here are the coefficients. Forget this side for the moment. So I'm going to come back to that later. The, here are the coefficients of the various terms and the scalar piece that I wrote out up here. The R pieces are just these guys here. Okay. So you can get it from the non-local action again, just like before. Okay, um, good. All right. So for scale symmetries, we've. So in case you can't tell, I like the this the heat kernel methods because you can all of a sudden do an amazing amount of work without doing hardly any work at all once you understand how to use the heat kernel. Okay. So here comes the, then the section on conformal symmetry. Okay. The conformal symmetry in general is a rescaling of the metric. So G prime of X is, I'll use E to the two sigma as my general rescaling. And sigma is a function of position. So that, that's more a bigger rescaling than we had before. So it's a, it's a position dependent rescaling. And at the same time, your fields in your theory will, will change. Phi prime will be, well, be equal to e to some power p times sigma of x. Um, phi. Okay, that it depends on what your field is. If it's a scalar field, p is one. Okay, then actually minus one. Then, if this is a symmetry, then if we do this rescaling, we get no change in the action. And no change in the action means, so let's imagine that I have some matter Lagrangian. So this is just the matter piece here of phi and G. The change then would be um, D4X times the change in the um, matter action variation with respect to phi times delta phi. 
plus the change in the matter action with respect to G times delta G. For infinitesimal variations, we know that this piece is the Euler-Lagrange equations. So the variation of the action matter part with respect to phi, this part is equal to zero by the Euler-Lagrange equation. That is the Euler-Lagrange equation. And this piece now is, is for infinitesimal. This is delta G is two sigma times G itself. Okay, this guy is T mu nu. <laughs> this guy is two sigma G mu nu. So, the first time guy vanishing, the second one being the energy momentum tensor. This tells us the symmetry is the G mu nu T mu nu equals zero, which is, again, the trace of the energy momentum tensor is equal to zero. Okay. So conformal symmetry has the consequence that the energy momentum tensor has to, has to vanish, if it's a symmetry. Okay. Um, Let's let's do this for scalar fields. For scalar fields, we're going to take g mu nu goes to e to the two sigma g mu nu. This tells me that that g upper mu nu, which is the inverse, goes to e to the minus two sigma g upper mu nu. It tells us that the square root of g goes to e to the four sigma square root of g. So those how how the metric changes. Um, The, if you then carry through what these transformations do, I, I, know it, I know what the connection does, but let me just write down the curvature. The curvature goes to e to the minus two um, sigma times the curvature itself plus six box lambda of sigma, sorry. Um, okay, good. I actually, I actually think this is actually, I think it's true for, for this particular one is true for, I think for all of them, because I have the e to the minus two sigma factored out. As far as I know, this is correct. Okay. Um, it's true that the only thing I've ever personally worked out is the is the linear piece, but I've I've seen it written this way in in books, and I and I think it's probably true in general. Okay, um, if we have the scalar box. Which is is one over square root of g d mu square root of g g mu nu. Actually, let's, I, I want that lower and this upper, and then this lower. Okay, um, that goes to 
e to the minus two sigma box plus two d lambda d I'm sorry d mu sigma d mu. Okay, so the, the, this last guy here doesn't um, get any change, but the derivative acting on those square root of g's gives me a, a, this d mu sigma. Okay. okay. Then we have, we're going to take the scalar field and make it e to the minus sigma. Go to the scalar field. And then with a little work, here's here's the calculation that's interesting. If I take box plus one sixth R on fog. Okay, that's a particular combination. Okay, this goes to we can see this e to the minus two sigma um, from both of the terms. So that factors out. It's box plus two d mu sigma d mu um, plus one six r one six r plus box sigma e to the minus sigma phi. The sorry. okay, when box acts on e to the minus sigma phi, there's two pieces. There's a piece. One of the derivatives can act on sigma, and the other derivatives can act on phi. Both of them can act on sigma, or both of them can act on phi. So there are those those two pieces there. So this is e to the minus two sigma. Um, I'll pull out a, this e to the minus sigma through. I get box acting on phi. And then I get minus box acting on sigma. And I get the cross terms, which was minus 2 d mu sigma d mu acting on phi. And then I have the plus 2 d, d mu sigma d mu acting on phi plus the one sixth r phi. This then equals e to the minus three sigma box plus one sixth r acting on phi. Okay, so the box sigmas cancel. There's two miracles happen the box sigmas. Cancelled, the cross terms cancelled, and we're golden. Okay. The so this this then gives an invariant wave equation, and then it's not hard to see then if I have integral d for x square root of g phi box r phi this is invariant because the phi goes uh, square root of g goes e to the four sigma phi goes e to the minus sigma box plus the six r goes like e to the minus three sigma all the sigmas cancel out this is invariant So that's that's um, then conformally symmetric. So this, if you people remember way back when I first treated the scalar field, I had this parameter C R C C being equal to one six is conformally invariant.
Anything else is not. There's that special value there. Um, I should say that the, the usual way we write it actually, if we have square root of G times G mu nu, D mu phi, D nu phi, that action is invariant only up to a total derivative um, plus, what is this, what is it? Um, it's d mu square root of g, g mu nu, d nu phi times sigma over two. Got my, got my answer, and I'm sorry, That's not actually not right. It's 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 g mu nu phi squared sits in here, and then it's d nu sigma. That's what it is. Anyhow, it's a total derivative, so it still counts as an invariant. The okay. Photons photons are also conformally invariant. Um, the action for photons is is integral d four x um, square root of g g mu nu g alpha beta. F mu alpha, F mu beta, so that's in a quarter, of course. This is invariant with just F mu nu goes to F mu nu, so you don't have to rescale F mu nu at all. And then the e to the two sigmas you cancel this e to the two minus two sigma, e to the minus two sigma, e to the four sigma. Um, that cancels by itself. And so you're golden uh, here. Okay, so photons are conformally invariant. Um, scalars are if C is equal to one six. So now we saw that the consequence of this was that the 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 trace was supposed to be zero. So the conformal anomaly Formal anomaly comes, but it's, the calculation is pretty much what we did. So we have g mu nu goes to e to the two sigma g mu nu phi goes to e to the minus sigma phi. The Jacobian of that transformation. So we're here. We're just doing the integral just over matter at this stage is the determinant of e to the minus sigma because we're just it's we're doing the the rescaling of this this is then just just what we calculated before you just the same old a2 coefficient when regularized the same way. And so we've again done the whole calculation. So same trace. T mu mu is now, since we're doing gravitational physics, it has 
all the usual pieces with the you know the R mu nu alpha beta R mu alpha beta one over sixteen pi squared one over one eighty blah 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 okay you get what what you got before. The one normally when you're doing the discussing the, the conformal anomalies is not doing the integral over the over the the gravitational degrees of freedom, but the gravitational degrees of freedom do give a a contribution to the overall action. So we're gonna see that in just a minute. But one reason that you don't discuss it normally is that general relativity is not conformally invariant. Okay, remember the action is is integral d for, for x square root of minus g. Um, Two over kappa squared times r, and this goes to um, squared minus g e to the four lambda, the four sigma e to the minus two sigma r plus the six box sigma. So. Neither the prefactors cancel, nor the, um, nor does the, nor is it invariant by itself. Okay, and that's you know, logic-wise, it's because it's not invariant under rescaling because there's a dimensionful coupling constant there, right? Okay. Could that be over Yeah, 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 it's uh, while squared, while squared. Yeah, I'm not going to do that right now, actually. Okay, so let's, when you're discussing conformal symmetry, there's a special place in everyone's heart for the vial tensors. So let's, yeah, let's, let's give it its own screen. Okay, um, this is going to be a tensor that rescales in the same way that the metric rescales. So g mu nu goes to e to the two sigma g mu nu. Vi the vial tensor c mu nu alpha beta is going to go to e to the two sigma c mu nu alpha beta. So it has, and there's none of these extra terms that add like derivatives of the fields. And then so in, in D dimensions, we're only gonna use it in four, but that's okay. Here's the, the general answer since, since somebody else worked it out and I don't have to do it. C mu nu alpha beta is R mu nu alpha beta minus one over D minus two. So that's normally just a half. It's G mu alpha R nu beta. And then there's symmetries. It's anti-symmetric in um, alpha beta, beta R nu alpha, and anti-symmetric in um, mu and nu. G nu alpha R mu beta plus G nu beta R mu alpha. Okay, and then there's an extra piece which is one over plus one over D minus one, one over D minus two. So that's, that's one sixth normally. 
G mu alpha, G nu beta minus G nu alpha, G nu beta, same symmetries times the scalar curvature. Okay. So it, this is useful because, because it has this homogeneous rescaling. When squared, let me just give this to you. It's C mu nu alpha beta, C mu nu alpha beta. Turns into terms like we know and love C, R mu nu alpha beta, R mu nu alpha beta, and then a bunch of minus two R mu nu, R mu nu, plus one third r squared. That's in 4D. I don't know it in general. But but the the question that Botham asked is, can you make this an invariant action? So here's a conformally invariant action. If you take square root of g, g mu, mu prime, g nu, nu prime, g alpha, alpha prime, g beta, beta prime, c mu, nu, alpha, beta, c mu prime, nu prime, alpha prime, beta prime. Okay, so this is really just square root of G, C, okay, so I've just raised all the indices. This, this goes like E to the four sigma. These guys each go like E to the minus two sigma, so E to the minus two sigma to the fourth. And then the curvature, these guys go like E, e to the two sigma, and there's two of them. So because that's the, all the sigmas, because it transforms homogeneously, this is invariant. And so there's a big temptation to try to start with a conformally invariant world and try to get out uh, physics out. The person to look this up if you're interested is Phil Mannheim of the University of Connecticut, who has worked as hard as humanly possible to, to uh, make this into a viable theory. But so he doesn't. So 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 what Phil tries to do is he tries to start with this Lagrangian, and and shows that that the solutions that you're used to in general relativity are also solutions to this theory. But it, since it has extra derivatives, it has an ambiguity. If you fix the ambiguity, um, you know you you can get recover the same solutions, but but there's more solutions also. Okay. And the, he tries to he tries to get around this. Okay, um, it's uh, it's an interesting attempt. I don't know. I, you know. I don't know what the reality. You know, most people don't take it as as yielding general relativity, but and there are times when I feel he has to stand on his head to make it work. But wow. he's he's done a lot of work on it. Yeah. Well, so the 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 beauty of this, if we could do it, is to is that you could start off. Imagine starting off with a conformally invariant world, and yield our our world. And so one of the activities in even in LHT physics right now is trying to formulate conformally invariant standard models. If you did that, you'd probably want to have conformally invariant gravity, make make conformal symmetry of a symmetry of nature. Uh, 
Okay, so the phenomenal. So, yeah. So, so Phil's one of Phil's reasons for wanting to do it is to solve the dark matter problem by doing rotation curves slightly differently. So, you, using the ambiguity that you have, the extra solution. Sarah's smiling in the back. She's been she's been at UConn. You've heard, you've been working on that. He hates what? He hates dark matter. Yes, I know he hates dark matter. Yes. Yeah. Well, uh, actually, if you hear, ever hear Phil talk, he actually, because he hates it so badly, he finds all the flaws in the, the theory and presents them very clearly. So it's actually, it's interesting to hear him talk. Okay. Would that be, I mean, maybe that's a way, but would that be, would that have any control Yeah. Um, so, so the question was con consequences on asymptotic safety, um, and and I don't know the answer on that. Uh, okay, just just to conclude this little bit here, um, the the vial tensor also has these properties that any contraction of any of the indices gives zero. So if I have um, I'll just write that. Otherwise, you you could form lower rank tensors by contracting these things. So G mu alpha C mu nu alpha beta equals zero. And given the symmetry properties, that's basically all you need to show. It's anti-symmetric mu nu, anti-symmetric alpha beta. So. With, if it was beta, it would be also zero. Nu would also be zero. Anti-symmetric and alpha beta, alpha beta means if I made G alpha beta, that's also zero. So all those guys vanish. And then if if G mu nu is e to the two sigma eta mu nu, so that's a conformal space time, this implies that this guy is equal to zero. And this in particular actually works for flat um, Friedman, Robertson Walker universes. But it's, this is also interesting for the anomaly. The, the various forms of the anomaly conformal anomaly is proportional to C squared. Okay. And to do that, I'm going to again use a, use some work that Bossom did. Um, I've got it propagated down here. Let's see if I can cut it. Uh, if it doesn't work, I'll just do it down here. All right. In this page, this is this non-local Lagrangians again. The non-local Lagrangians can be rewritten in a basis that's, that's the R log box R. So that was like before. Now I've used vial log box vial. And then this piece here is like the Gauss-Binet identity. Remember, R mu nu alpha beta squared minus four R mu nu squared plus R squared is a total derivative. And this is gauss bonnet So if you write it in this basis, the, the, this term here, when I form the anomaly, that particular combination is this. So it's a total derivative. So it doesn't influence any matrix elements. C squared remains. And then if you go back and you look at the coefficients up here that I gave these guys, um, in this basis, we used alpha bar, beta bar, gamma bar. For conformal fields, all the alpha bars vanished. 
the beta bars all had the same sign and the gammas are irrelevant because it gives a total derivative. So for conformally invariant fields, um, let's see, I'll put it, write it down here. For the T mu nu is proportional to some number, it's this beta bar times C mu nu alpha beta, C mu nu alpha beta. Okay, now you didn't need this non-local Lagrangian to do that. It's just, I happen to have it printed up. If you just went, go back and do the transformation on the A2 coefficients, that's what you get. Okay, good. So that's the conformal anomaly. That's actually all I'm gonna do about it. And for the, the rest of the class, I'm gonna do the axial anomalies. But if you, if anyone wants to ask about conformal anomalies, the one of the uses of a conformal anomaly I, actually is in the Hawking radiation. If I get time, I'm hoping still, I haven't prepared it yet, but if I get time, I'll try to show you how trace anomaly is related to. A couple of classic papers, which I have to somehow condense. Okay. So the the other anomaly that lives in the world is this axial anomaly, and there's a both a non gravitational and a gravitational version of that also. And so we can we can do that using very simply using the same things we did before. The, um, the current here, the current is in general, something that looks like psi bar gamma u gamma five psi, it's an axial current. And in this, in real world applications, there can be some flavor dependence of this. So let's, in QCD, for example, if I have the singlet current, which is gonna be U bar plus D bar plus S bar, up, down, and strange course. This guy is anomalous. in QCD. If I have a different one, so this is a singlet current. If I have this guy, let's call it eight. I'm gonna do the same thing. Um, this guy plus that guy minus two times that guy. This guy's not anomalous. We'll see from the calculation that the it's flavor independent. So if I have one plus one minus two, I'm gonna get zero. But just to confuse things, I don't wanna confuse things. I wanna unconfuse them. If I have J3, which is U bar gamma mu gamma five U minus D bar gamma mu gamma five D. This has no QCD anomaly. Okay, because it's one minus one. But it does have a QED anomaly. Because the up quark charges and the down quark charges are not the same. And so the cancellation just doesn't appear. Um, so the first one up there would have both QED and QCD. The second one will have Q 
QCD, a QED, the le and the last one has just QED. Okay. So the the symmetries of these are associated with the symmetry is the field psi goes to e to the i. Let's call it alpha gamma five psi. And this is a symmetry um, of, of massless theories of massless direct equations. If I have the Lagrangian psi bar i d slash psi is invariant under this gamma five rotation, the the mass terms M psi bar psi are not invariant. Yeah, I, I can do that if we want, but it's basically the, when you take the conjugate, you get the, uh, there's the, well, let's, let's not talk it through. Um, the concept, but the consequence of this gamma five rotation is then that the the axial current, if this is j mu five, d mu j five mu equals zero, so the axial current, that the gamma five is there, and, I, and I'm not sure if how much you do remember about gamma fives and all this stuff, um, but it's okay. Um, it you just have to. Um, you just you'll take my word for it on it. Okay, um, it, gamma five is as is so long story to do to do gamma five right now. But it's gamma five is gamma zero, gamma one, gamma two, gamma three, and uh, it, what it does is it. It's a signal of parity violation or parity opposite parity. So this this current here, this current that I gave there with the gamma five in it, is an axial current instead of a vector current. It has opposite parity structure. Okay, that's that's all I'm going to tell you. Okay, I can tell you more if you want to chat. Okay, the but now again, as our handy. Uh, Heat kernel expansion comes into play very easily. So that this here's the calculation of the anomaly. Um, basically, it's just like we did before. You have the transformation is. Um, Psi goes to e to the minus um, beta gamma five psi. The psi bar actually goes the same way. It goes to e to the minus beta gamma five psi bar. And so then the the when I'm doing the path integral d psi d by bar prime prime is equal to integral d psi d psi bar times the Jacobian. The Jacobian is just e to the minus two beta. Sorry, let's, let's so actually let's, let's be precise. It's trace of beta gamma five. Where the trace goes over the Dirac indices, it goes over the space time indices. And if there's more than one flavor, it goes over the flavor indices. So if I'm doing this uh, one with three flavors, then it goes over the flavor indices too. Okay. And we regular, regulate that by taking this as so the limit 
m goes to infinity of e to the minus 2 i trace beta gamma 5 e to the minus d slash over m squared. And so the brackets go there. And I, I actually gave you this, the heat kernel expansion for this. Remember we had d mu, d mu plus sigma, and sigma had a sigma mu nu, f mu nu in it. And when we expand out trace gamma five sigma squared is where the action comes from. It's, it, I get, I get a term that's non-zero. You can sort of see it. It's trace of gamma five sigma mu nu sigma alpha beta is, if you know your Dirac traces, you can read it's 4i epsilon mu nu alpha beta. So you get epsilon mu nu alpha beta times f mu nu f alpha beta. And the, the answer then comes out, this is, this is for the QCD, QCD one, um, d mu j5 mu equals three alpha over, actually no, this is the QED one. A single, this is a single, a fair man. over 8 pi f mu nu, f mu nu. So I think I've got the right, I think it's that, okay. Anyway, you get the right, right coefficient in our book easily. Um, and this is dual, and this guy is the one half epsilon mu nu alpha beta f alpha beta, and it comes from that. Okay. So lightning derivation of the, the axial anomaly. You can also do it with Feynman diagrams, yes. Yeah. So, so what's the phenomenology of this guy? Okay. So there's two pieces of phenomenology that that occurs for this. Um, one is the case when E and M pi zero goes to two gammas. The okay. So that's that's from the QED one. D where the divergence of the axial current um, is alpha f squared. Okay, so this leads the pi not to two gamma. So it takes a little work to get there, but basically, the, the this pi on current. There's a matrix element of the axial current, um, pi j zero, which, and then this piece gives me the two photons, so I get pi to two gammas. Okay, and then the second important use of the anomaly is to show that that the symmetry associated with the singlet here, the U1 axial charge, is not a symmetry, it's anomalous. So nor, it used to be that you'd worry that, that this is naively conserved. There should be a Goldstone boson associated with it, just like there's Goldstone bosons associated with the other axial charges, pi ions and k ions. There is no Goldstone boson associated with a singlet because it's not a symmetry. Yeah, yeah, so I was gonna say that. I was gonna say that too. Um, that's my next thing actually. So these are, these are, those were the two examples. So the U1, 
axial is not a symmetry. So those are the two phenomenologies that, that one deals with it. And then the other thing, Boston was just referring to the the constraints on anomalies and gauge currents. Okay, so basically the currents that I described up there were global currents. Global currents. In other words, global currents are ones that are not connected to, to gauge fields. They're not associated with a gauge symmetry. These are okay. But anomalies in gauge currents make the theory inconsistent. Okay. So are always to be avoided. And then this gives us a set of anomaly conditions. I have to do this quickly, but which is basically if I have various currents here, A, B, C, trace of Q, A, Q, V, Q, uh, V, A, I, J, K. If those are gauge currents, and these are the charges, has to equal zero. Okay. Let me not say more because I need to have one more thing I have to say. Because I was doing gravity here, there's also a gra axial gravitational anomaly. Okay, and you can, you just need to know to know the the a two coefficient for fermions, which is actually in Parker and Tom, and we we didn't we had trouble finding it before. Um, and yeah, so d mu j axial mu is one over three, I think this is for a single fermion, 384 pi squared, epsilon mu nu alpha beta, r mu nu lambda sigma, r alpha beta lambda sigma. So there's an axial anomaly. And the Dartmouth guys may recognize this from work of Stefan Alexander. Stefan Alexander is the one who's made some hay with this one, um, this axial current. You, you can get an anomaly in lepton currents and this can be used in leptogenesis. Okay, so Stefan is the expert on that. And so let me just stop there. Okay, good. Thank you. Next time we start um, pathway, three things on Bogdilbov, Hawking, and Unruh. Okay, good. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Yep, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye.